Hello, welcome all to this Fab Friday. We have an excellent program and speaker today. First, a couple of program flow notes. My name is Hope Warshaw, and I'm a member of the group that plans the health education focused Fab Friday programs. I'll introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Tasha Woodall, in a moment. She will speak for about an hour or so, and we have built in four very brief pauses to respond to needs for clarifications that are placed in the Q&A box by you. When Tasha is done speaking, we'll have about 15 minutes for Q&A. So please, during the program, drop your questions in the Q&A box, and I will pose your questions to Tasha. So I want to start with a thanks to Tasha for her patience on presenting this topic. It was originally scheduled for an in-person Fab Friday, pre-COVID, roughly about a year ago. But here we are, and I'm delighted she agreed to give this talk virtually. To my introduction, Tasha Woodall graduated with her Doctor of Pharmacy degree from Purdue University and completed a residency in ambulatory care with Mission Hospital and Mountain Area Health Education Center, or MAHEC as we know it, here in Asheville. And obviously she stayed. Currently, Tasha works as an Associate Director of Pharmacotherapy in Geriatrics for MAHEC and co-directs MAHEC's Center for Healthy Aging. She also trains PharmD students in a specialty residency in geriatrics. She's an adjunct faculty member for UNC's School of Medicine and teaches the, at the UNC Eshelman School of Pharmacy. She practices in two continuing care retirement communities in Asheville and with Mayhex's home-based primary care program. I'm delighted to welcome Tasha. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm really looking forward to this. I have been for a year. It's been a long time coming. I am going to attempt here to share my screen. And we will just jump right in. Okay. So, um, you know, the title of this is, do you feel like you take too many medications? And I hope for many of you, the answer to that is no. It feels like a reasonable number. Maybe you're not taking any, which is fantastic. Um, but for a lot of people, the answer to that question is very much yes. And so just to unpack that a little bit before we kind of get into the issue, I'm going to start by introducing someone who I'll call Gary, who lives with his wife in Woodfin. Um, he's a retired teacher. He loves to fish. So let's just consider this scenario, which um, is very realistic for a lot of folks. Say at age 65, um, Gary is diagnosed with high blood pressure and with high cholesterol. And so his primary care doctor prescribes him a medication for each of those conditions. And then a handful of years later, he's also diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And he, so he's prescribed a third medication to help control his blood glucose or his blood sugar. And a year after that, the guidelines change a little bit, as they will do from time to time, as our um, sort of expert clinicians review new literature that becomes available. And these guidelines put Gary's blood pressure in a higher risk category. So another blood pressure medication is added. Now, where we know that one of the potential pitfalls is when these expert panelists are reviewing all of the studies that have been published to help them make decisions about what to recommend for the general population, typically people like Gary are underrepresented in those studies. So we have to do a little bit of extrapolating and a little bit of uh, interpretive dance around that, if you will, um, because at the end of the day, we, we don't know with as much certainty um, as we would for someone um, who might be one, two, or three decades younger than Gary, um, that, that those medications will impact him in quite the same way. So he's prescribed another blood pressure medicine, medicine and weeks later, Gary is feeling, <clears throat> excuse me, he's feeling lightheaded and he falls while he's at the store and breaks his leg. 
So he goes to the hospital, <clears throat> gets surgery on his leg. And the doctor there uh, gives him an opioid medication, a narcotic, to help his pain from his broken bone. Well, it doesn't take long after that where Gary's feeling depressed, he's having trouble sleeping. So his primary care provider, who's unaware of the fact that he received an opioid pain medication while he was in the hospital, prescribes him additional medications to help him sleep and to help his mood because he feels depressed. And if we skip on down the line, by the time Gary reaches his next birthday, he's feeling dizzy, he's feeling confused. He ends up accidentally rear-ending a car at a traffic light and his family becomes really concerned about him that he's starting to develop memory problems or dementia. And now there are a lot of questions swirling about whether it's even safe for Gary to remain in his home with his wife and would then. So this is just one scenario and I'm going to circle back to Gary at the end of this presentation because I think there are a lot of stops along the way where um, you as an informed consumer of healthcare and we as healthcare providers can do a better job for people like Gary. So I'm just going to run through some numbers, some statistics so that we can all get on the same page with sort of the scope of the issue here. And the first of these is that there are 750 older people, we'll call older 65 and older, of course, that's sort of an arbitrary cutoff. Um, but 750 are hospitalized every day because of a serious medication side effect. What we do know on average is that each additional medication that gets added to your list will increase the risk of an adverse drug event by about 7 to 10%. 35 million older people have sought medical treatment for an adverse drug event in the last 10 years. So either by scheduling a doctor's visit or going into the emergency department. So not all of those are serious, but 35 million who are having some untoward side effect from a medication. So of those, 2 million have been admitted to the hospital because their adverse drug event was serious. So again, that's, that's in the last 10 years. Um, I think it's interesting to note that older adults are hospitalized for adverse drug events at a greater rate than the general population is hospitalized for opioids. And of course, the, the opioid crisis is a public health crisis um, and it's gotten a lot of attention as it rightfully should. Um, this is another situation where I feel more attention could be paid by the healthcare system. About four in 10 older adults take five or more prescription medications per day. Now there's nothing magical about that number of five. In some older studies or older descriptions that were published, five was sort of this, again, arbitrary cutoff or what would be considered polypharmacy, meaning of course, many medications. Some polypharmacy can be considered appropriate. Someone who has multiple chronic conditions may do well on five medications or more. But that's a pretty staggering number that we're approaching half of the population taking that many. And then if we really just focus in on the rightmost couple of bars here, looking at the time frame between 1988 and 1994 compared with the time frame between just 2013 and 2014, so just a couple of years, for um, folks 65 and older, you can see the proportion increasing of people who were taking some medication being sort of the light blue bars between one and four, and then the proportion taking five or more going up from 13.8% to 42.2%. So this, this issue is getting exponentially worse as we go along. Um, there's a wonderful report from the Lown Institute that was published in 2019, and forgive me, I know that you all know how to read, but I'm going to read this to you because I think this quote sort of drives the point home that medications have indeed improved the lives of individuals around the world, and many patients benefit from taking multiple drugs, we know this. Indeed, polypharmacy 
however you want to define it, may be necessary for people who have more than one chronic disease. However, taking multiple medications also greatly increases a person's risk of suffering a serious, sometimes life-threatening side effect. Over the past few decades, medication use in the United States, especially for older people, has gone far beyond necessary polypharmacy to the point where millions are overloaded with too many prescriptions and are experiencing significant harm as a result. So the Lowen Institute calls this problem of medication overload America's other drug problem. And there are a number of different types of prescribing patterns that feed into this issue. There is the never necessary prescribing, the prescribing of medications that we know either don't work very well or have too many side effects to be worth the risk. And it's never necessary regardless of, of age. We also have indicated but not beneficial prescribing. So medications that technically by the textbook are indicated because someone has, for instance, um, depression. And please understand, depression is an under-recognized problem that we absolutely should address and treat. But in certain individuals, even though an antidepressant medication may be indicated, it might not be as beneficial as something that is not a medication, something like therapy, counseling, et cetera, physical exercise. Again, depending on the individual, um, there is no longer necessary prescribing. So I think one of the medications that jumps to mind for me as an example of this is people who get started on a proton pump inhibitor. So examples of that class of medications would be omeprazole, which is the generic name for Prilosec or Nexium or Protonics. Um, these proton pump inhibitors are frequently prescribed for people who complain of some degree of heartburn or even people who are hospitalized to prevent um, a bleed in their stomach associated with all of the other factors that go into being an inpatient in the hospital. But it is not necessary for them to continue, in many cases, on that medication for the rest of their lives. So in that sense, we, be, we, can, we can consider it no longer necessary prescribing. All of the medications that get added in earlier in life and middle age that just hang out on the drug list, even though they're no longer needed. And then the fourth thing here is unnecessary over-the-counter and supplement use. Um, and I'm not here today to... Um, speak out against supplements or over-the-counter drugs. I think certainly there are gaps in the literature um, for many of these supplements. And um, in general, I tend to advise folks that I help care for to avoid putting anything in their body that has not had a fair shot at being studied to determine whether it is in fact effective and, and two, that it's not going to cause some type of long-term side effect. So some of that also contributes to this medication overload. And I've already made this point, but you can see compared with 1994 and 2014, I know this may be a little difficult to see because of the way it copied in here, but if you can make out these little icons um, are representative of, of little people that make up the population, and the red people are the proportion of those who took four or more medications previously versus in 2014. So a 10-year period, and again, this is just another way of looking at the remarkable increase that has happened. And we have to ask ourselves the question why that is. So part of it is just that there is a culture of prescribing in the United States. Um, part of this is driven by this thought process that prescribing is kind. It helps validate people. You know, you come to me with a problem and I send you out with a medication. That's my way of validating that you do indeed have an issue. And here's something that I'm going to provide um, for you in order to address that issue. Um, there is the thought of prescribing as a quick so that it might be 
a lot faster than addressing things like lifestyle factors, which have a huge role in delaying progression of chronic diseases. Um, maybe it's faster just to prescribe a medication. Um, direct to consumer advertising, don't get me started. There are two countries in the entire world that allow drug manufacturers to put commercials on TV and put ads in magazines that go directly to people that they are intended to treat, and that is New Zealand and the United States. Um, direct marketing to prescribers, to physicians. This is not something that happens everywhere, but you know, you walk into a lot of drug or a, a lot of physicians' offices, and there's a drug rep there with a box full of samples and all of the reasons that the physician should be prescribing this really expensive medication that was just approved. And then there is the just societal perception that polypharmacy is normal, the soci that, that society is primed to think that this is an inevitable part of aging, when in fact that's not the case at all. So I think there are a lot of things that um, support the notion that the United States healthcare system is intentionally or unintentionally set up in such a way that really incentivizes this culture of prescribing. And therefore, naturally, there are barriers that exist to scaling back on doses of medications or to deprescribing them and discontinuing them um, altogether. And we know there are consequences associated with this. Some of them are fairly common sense and fairly intuitive. Clearly, the more medications you take, the more they cost. Um, even if you have an excellent uh, prescription drug plan and get all of these at almost no copay at all, it still presents a significant burden on the healthcare system in terms of the dollars that go into the production of those medications. I already talked about the fact that every medication that gets added to someone's list on average will increase the risk for a side effect by about seven to 10%. Again, it's important to clarify that that's an average because some medications are fairly harmless and will increase that risk not at all, while others will increase it much more than 10%. Um, the more medications you take, the more likely you are um, to have an interaction between two or more of them. Not all medications play nicely together in the body. And, and then the more you take, maybe the harder it is to remember to take all of those doses or to want to take all of those doses. And so it, it ends up impacting your ability to be adherent or compliant with the medication regimen that your prescriber has recommended for you. Now, there are other things that, you know, it's difficult to establish causation here. We can't necessarily say that medication X was the one thing that caused this person to fall, for instance. There are usually many factors involved in all of the things that you see listed on this slide. But we do know that there is at least an association between the number of medications an individual takes and their likelihood of experiencing a decline in their function or their independence, um, their likelihood of falling, experiencing urinary incontinence, having malnutrition, experiencing cognitive impairment or memory problems, having something like delirium, especially if institutionalized in a long-term care facility or admitted to a hospital. And there's an association with mortality, which is early death is what that means. So um, the information on this slide actually comes from an article that was published just recently in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society that was looking at consumer perspectives on medication value. And they went through in this sort of structured process and interviewed a lot of people who take medication and their caregivers that applied in a particular situation and asked about um, things that were associated with someone perceiving that a given medication on their medication list was valuable to them 
versus one that they didn't really consider that valuable. And there were themes that emerged from these conversations. So people um, on medications and their caregivers found that four of these things were associated with the, just this perceived like attachment um, to the medication or the perception that it was valuable. One of those was, of course, perceived effectiveness. If someone was able to see an improvement in their symptoms, or even if it isn't a symptom control drug, like something that you would take for pain, for instance, or for constipation, um, people like to see an improvement in their clinical values. So if you have diabetes, seeing the change in your blood glucose or the change in your hemoglobin A1C, being able to check your blood pressure and see that it is now 20 points lower, even if you don't feel any different, whether it's 160 or 130, seeing that improvement helps contribute to this perception that the medication is valuable. And then in certain instances, people assign value to medications that they knew were going to prevent them from having complications. So an example of that might be someone with um, a heart arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation that we know puts you at greater risk for having a stroke. And so taking a medication that they knew was going to decrease the odds that they would have a stroke. The second bucket was effects on quality of life. So whether the medication was associated with any side effects, how severe that was, how inconvenient it was to take it. So maybe medications that were dosed two, three, four times a day, or if there was discomfort associated with taking the medication, maybe really large pills or an oral solution that tastes awful that was associated. Clearly the impact of cost and the effect that that has on the family's finances. And then the relationship with the provider. So someone um, in, in this, this group of folks that were interviewed might just in general um, associate greater value or benefit with the medications they take if he or she has a really good strong relationship with their their doctor or the person that prescribes those medications. So um, there were a couple of things that came out of those conversations where people, caregivers, um, really enjoyed a team approach to prescribing. So maybe, okay, well, I, I feel like this medication is good for me because not only did my doctor recommend it, but the clinical pharmacist who works with my doctor um, thought it seemed like a good idea or um, the dietitian said it would be a good idea to supplement the things that I'm doing with my diet by taking this medication. And then if the provider was just a good listener and was hearing what the person was saying about what they did and did not want out of their health care, which is what I'm going to spend the bulk of my remaining time talking about is really getting to the crux of what do you want out of your health care, because that has such a huge impact on um, medications the medications that you can and should be taking. So I'm going to pause there before we go on. Um, Hope, what what questions do we have? Anything that I didn't explain well? Uh, no, it doesn't seem to be. So I think, I mean, we've gotten a few questions and I encourage people to, you know, load the Q&A box with your questions. Um, but we what we can't do is we cannot answer your individual health situation questions. So I'll just put that out there as people put their questions in. So and with that being question. said, I am going to provide my contact information at the end of this presentation. So um, I am happy to, to help answer some of those things if they're a little bit more individual specific, if you want to reach out to me personally after. after. Sure. Yeah. So Great. forge ahead. All right. So we'll keep on moving. So the question is, how do we know what works? And this, this um, photograph comes out of that Lown Institute report that I referenced earlier. This is a week's worth of medications for a 92-year-old person before and after the process of deprescribing. So it's just sometimes really remarkable to uh, visualize the impact that this can have. I'm going to talk not real long, but, but just go into a, a few examples of ways that the medical community has actually 
studied the prescribing of an intervention the same way we would study whether it is beneficial to add statin medication for someone's cholesterol after they've had a heart attack. So there was this de-prescribed trial, which was done in Canada with community pharmacists who provided education, both verbally and in writing, to customers who came into their pharmacy and to the providers who were prescribing their medications about four different families of medications that we know are riskier to use in people who are older. So any of the sedative hypnotic medications, for instance, Ambien, um, benzodiazepines like lorazepam that are sometimes prescribed for sleep or for anxiety. Um, the first generation antihistamines. So this is things like Benadryl or Unisom that you might buy over the counter either for sleep or for allergies. And we know that there are second generation antihistamines that are safer to use. Um, gliburide, which is a particular type of blood glucose lowering medication used in diabetes that um, probably goes a little too far in many instances and causes blood sugars that are too low or hypoglycemia. And then the NSAIDs, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen, naproxen, some of these medications that are commonly used for pain, but that we do know can take a toll on the kidneys, uh, the blood pressure, and can increase the risk for a gastrointestinal bleed. So they had some target drugs. And what this study found was that around one in three people who the community pharmacists targeted with this education were able to successfully stop whatever the offending drug was after getting education about how to do that safely. So for instance, sedative hypnotic. You know, if you're on a benzodiazepine, you've taken it for years for anxiety. We know there are safer options available, but it's not necessarily something that you want to come off of cold turkey. So this education involved, you know, here are the risks. Um, here's how well the medication actually works, which is typically not as um, impressive as a lot of people perceive that it is. And, and then here's a tapering schedule to get yourself off of it. And so by providing people with the education to empower them to discontinue their own medications, they found that about one in three people were able to successfully stop. And that's pretty impressive, honestly. And then this study was looking at people who were in nursing homes. And um, it was around 100 residents of a care facility who were on average about 84 years of age. And on average, there were about two medications prescribed, de-prescribed, excuse me, two medications stopped, de-prescribed per patient in this study in the intervention arm. And they looked at one year survival rate. And you can see that at one year, about 75% of people who had had, had their medications discontinued were still alive versus somewhere around 60% of the people who were not in this deprescribing intervention arm. So they actually fared better in terms of survival being on fewer medications. So when we're coming at this as healthcare providers, it kind of helps to divide things out into buckets and compartmentalize a little bit to help us make decisions about where is the low hanging fruit and what can we prune back. So part of making that determination is considering the bucket of medications that are really just intended to enhance quality of life. They control symptoms, things like pain medications, um, anti-anginal medications like nitrates that you take for chest pain, thyroid medication, things for diarrhea, for constipation. And we know that um, if we discontinue one of these medications, we're more likely to see a deterioration in quality of life, assuming that that underlying issue is still a problem. And this is one example of, of where we might bump into no longer necessary prescribing. 
maybe we've had somebody on Miralax for ages because they had a run of constipation. And if we trial off of the Miralax, maybe it's no longer an issue because they've done other things, incorporated some movement, um, some, you know, a walking routine to kind of help keep things moving. They're focusing on hydration and incorporating fiber into their diet and they don't need Miralax anymore. So just because something is in the symptom control bucket does not necessarily mean that it shouldn't be a target of deprescribing. But we just have to be careful about how we go about it because we might see in certain instances that there, is, there will be a deterioration in that. Now on the right here, the other bucket is preventive treatment. These are medications that are added to forestall adverse outcomes that we don't wanna see happen downstream of when the medication is started. So things like heart attacks, strokes, statins, blood thinners, like anticoagulants or antiplatelet agents like aspirin, medications for osteoporosis. Those medications don't get added to make you feel better in the moment. They get added to prevent you from having a heart attack or breaking a major bone um, in the instance of osteoporosis, like in the next 10 years. So we have to kind of separate those out and then recognize that there's a gray area here. Not every medication fits tidily into one of those two buckets because some medications may actually have both long and short-term benefits. So for instance, medications that get added for congestive heart failure. We know that some of those are associated with a mortality or survival benefit that you are more likely to still be alive in five years or in 10 years if you take this medication than if you don't. But we also know that they keep you from being fluid overloaded and having to go to the hospital and they can impact your breathing. So they do both. Same goes medications for high blood pressure. You know, I don't know if any of you have ever experienced um, having a blood pressure that's too high that's to impact your vision or it can cause headaches. So keeping the blood pressure below a certain level can certainly improve your quality of life in certain instances. And the same goes for medications that we use to treat diabetes. You know, we, we know that keeping the hemoglobin A1C under a certain level, um, and you know that what that level is, is a little bit up, up for debate. We'll talk about that here in a few minutes. Um, but keeping it below a certain level will prevent you from having long-term complications. But we also know that a blood sugar that runs high unchecked over a period of time is going to impact quality of life as well because you're having to run to the bathroom more often trying to pee out that sugar. Um, it can impact your, your sensation and um, potentially nerve pain in your extremities. So some medications fit in both areas. Okay. And then I wanted to point out a few different types of medications. These are the three classes of medications that contribute to 60% of emergency department visits for adverse drug reactions among older adults. So just these three classes of medications account for six out of 10 emergency room visits. Opioids used for pain, blood thinners, and that can include anything from aspirin or clopidogrel to something like warfarin or Eliquis, the anticoagulants that are used to prevent stroke in people with atrial fibrillation, and then the glucose lowering medications that we use to treat diabetes. Now, this does not mean because you have aspirin on your current medication list or because you have metformin on your list for diabetes that we need to stop these immediately because you know, you, that doesn't mean you have a 60% chance of going to the emergency room. These are very appropriate medications for a lot of people. It just bears monitoring and keeping it in mind. And when we think about glucose lowering medications, for instance, we know that certain classes of medications for diabetes are much more likely to cause low blood sugar, which is really the main concern that can present as an emergency situation um, than our others. So for instance, metformin I brought up as an example, uh, little to no risk that it's gonna cause hypoglycemia, a blood sugar that's too low. But something like um, gliburide that I mentioned a couple of slides ago, much greater likelihood. All right, 
Um, and then these three classes of medications are not the only ones that we need to be focused on. We're constantly considering harm versus benefit for lots of types of medications. And some of the ones that just come to my mind that I am constantly flagging as, oh, I need to ask more questions about how helpful this medication is, how long someone has been taking it, and whether they're experiencing any side effects, um, includes those sedative hypnotic drugs that we talked about that you might use for sleep or anxiety, um, hormone therapy, you know, women who start taking estrogen replacement around the time of menopause and then stay on it for 10 or 20 years. That's sort of a question mark in many cases. Um, the antihistamines like Benadryl that I mentioned specifically, the proton pump inhibitors like Prilosec or Nexium, the NSAIDs, and then the bladder medications. Um, and some of those are available over the counter too, like Oxybutin and, you know, Detrol. Those medications can, can definitely um, increase the risk for memory loss and fall. So harm versus benefit, constantly thinking through that. Okay, um, let me pause here again before I move on. Hope, any questions? Um, yeah, we have questions. I mean, some of them I will save for the end, but... Okay. Um, you know, you, I mean, you went through the three categories of um, sort of drug classes or categories that have the worst sort of worst implications. I mean, I think the point you made was related to worst because they drive people to the ER um, and they drive up healthcare expenditures. Um, but, um, you know, the person asked which drugs have the worst adverse drug reactions. I mean, I think, you know, there's other reasons other than healthcare expenditures right. that we should be looking at. Um, so if you want to just pontificate on that for a minute or two. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is a very complicated situation. And, um, and I'm actually kind of scrolling through the Q&A here as well. Um, and I, I do want to single one question out as just sort of an example, someone who takes a, takes a Travis Hood, which is a proton pump mm -hmm. inhibitor, and when he doesn't take it, it's heartburn, trouble swallowing, severe spasms. Yes, absolutely. This is absolutely a situation where a proton pump inhibitor is appropriate. Okay. Right. So the, the benefit of taking the medication outweighs the risk from taking it. So where this balance falls for each individual is different. And that's the main point that I want to make. Not that there are good guys and bad guys on the medication list. Just that for each one, we have to go through and consider the individual situation. And there's someone who would be in a very different camp who started taking Prilosec over the counter two years ago because they had a run of reflux that was associated with eating spaghetti and having acidic, acidic tomato sauce. Um, and could they probably safely come off their PPI? Usually that is the case, yes. But if you have other situations going on, then, then yeah, that, that the benefit of the medication may outweigh the risk. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so I think we can, um, you know, I think you'll touch on a number of points, mm -hmm. but we can, um, you know, it looks like we're going to have sufficient time for Q&A as well. Yeah, sounds good. So we'll good. circle that. Sounds good. All right. So I got my slide to advance. Here we go. I think there are some guiding principles here that helps both prescriber and person taking the medication as we're considering this process beginning to be prescribed. Number one, and this is where I will spend almost the entire rest of my time, will be to consider what matters most to you as the individual. And sometimes you have to really get out of your healthcare brain and forget that you're talking to your doctor and really just ask yourself these questions as a human being about what you want and we can connect that back to what you want from your healthcare. So if you don't can't quite conceptualize what I'm saying when I say that, hopefully you'll have some um, clarity here soon. So we have to think about what matters most to you. 
in general, a guiding principle is that we want to do just one, maybe two medications at a time. We don't want to chop your medication list in half overnight. Um, and this gives us a chance to sort of slowly take a medication off, consider whether there were any adverse consequences from that, and then we either add it back or we keep going. So this is a very trial and error process. Um, and then we have to assign priority. And, and my priorities as a geriatric pharmacist may be different from your priorities. I might see Xanax on your list and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I would love for us to figure out an alternative to that so that you are not taking a medication that's known to carry these excess risks. But for you, maybe it's easier just to start with some other low hanging fruit like your multivitamin. You eat a well-balanced diet. We don't know that taking a multivitamin makes you more likely to live a longer, healthier life than someone who doesn't take a multivitamin. Let's stop that one. You're probably not going to have any side effects from it. So I'll come up with my list of priorities and you come up with your list of priorities. And then it's a process of meeting in the middle. And it requires a lot of humility on the part of the healthcare provider and a lot of patience on the part of the consumer and his or her caregiver, because as I said, this is a trial and error process. We don't always know what's going to happen when we stop a medication. So we have to be willing to try different things. All right, so guiding principle number one was consider what matters most. And this is actually kind of a loaded question for a lot of people. So the reality that I think some healthcare providers don't fully appreciate is that there are a diverse array of preferences out there. Some people find healthcare more burdensome than others. You may be fine going to see your doctor every two to three months and going for all of the imaging tests that your doctor wants and checking your blood sugar four times a day and having whatever procedure done that your, your dentist and your neurologist and your eye doctor want you to have. But that can feel more burdensome for some people than it does others. There are also a lot of variations in what the primary goal of medical care is. So for some people, they just wanna stay with their loved ones for as long as they possibly can. So when longevity might be their, at the crux of their primary goals, or they might just be looking for comfort, you know, not wanting to be in pain all the time. Or maybe someone is looking for function, the ability to stay in their own home and be independent and still be able to cook for themselves and or, um, organize their medications in an orderly way. And certainly, I think many of us want all three of these things. But at a certain point, many will come to a crossroads where you have to assign some relative priority to one or two of those things. And then there's also variability and the care that someone is willing to receive and able to receive. And this just comes down to values and support systems. And that has to look different for every single person. So having a conversation with a healthcare provider that's aimed at identifying priorities, your priorities, moves the decision-making from, you need treatment X for disease Y to something that feels more like, knowing you, what's important to you, knowing your health conditions, your overall health, and what matters to you, I suggest we try this. So it feels different. And when we talk about values, we have to spend some time thinking about what makes you, you. Is it really important to you that you're able to <clears throat> connect with your neighbors, friends that you've grown accustomed to traveling with, your grandchildren? Um, is it really important to you to maintain your independence because you're someone who doesn't really like to ask for a lot of help um, and you want that dignity and that functioning? Um, are you someone who just really enjoys your leisure activities? Um, maybe not even so much with other folks, but being able to remain a productive member of society and engage in volunteer activities or do some form of personal or spiritual growth or go fishing like Gary, our sort of um, case um, example? Or do you place a lot of priority on managing your health, managing symptoms, 
so that you can breathe well and be able to walk for more than 20 feet. Um, now, I, I know that many of you are, are in outstanding health. Um, congratulations. Probably for many of you, all four of these things make up some portion of what makes you, you. But of course, if all 35 of you were to get together and talk about what, what really makes you tick, clearly there are going to make some, there are going to be some variations. So I'm going to bring up another example. This is Dave, 74 year old widower. He has diabetes, heart disease, and arthritis. So just as an example, here's some questions we might ask him as this helps him. I promise this is going to connect back to medications in the end. So which relationships are most important to you? Well, his daughter, his dog, his friends from church. What brings you the most enjoyment or pleasure? What makes life worth living? Taking walks with his dog, going to baseball games. When you're taking care of yourself, what's most important to you now? And he might say being able to walk, not being dependent on other people. And what do you hope your health care can do for you? Allow me to live by myself as long as possible. So you might answer these questions a little bit differently than Dave would, and that has to have a bearing on what we do for you from the healthcare side. So part of making health goals meaningful is making sure that they are based on your individual values, that they're realistic for you based on your current health, um, that they're specific. So they include exactly what to do and that they're flexible because things have to change over time as needed. So these are the, the sort of bedrock of what makes a health healthcare goal really impactful. Um, and then we might, we might ask questions about what your healthcare is making it difficult or what aspects of your healthcare are making it difficult for you to meet your goals. Because sometimes it's too much of a good thing, right? Like, we're trying to help, we're trying to give you these things to do to make sure that your blood pressure stays under control or your blood sugar stays under control. But because of what's really most important to you as a person, it's actually making it harder for you to be able to live the life that you want, or it doesn't fit with your priorities. So there are trade-offs, and I'm going to bring up an example of a trade-off too, because there are certain healthcare activities. Now, medications are a really prime example of this. There are certain healthcare activities like taking certain medications that may make some things better while making other things worse. And the only person who can really ultimately decide which trade-offs make sense in your life is you. So Dave might be on a diuretic or a water pill, if you will for his um, heart disease. And he might be willing to take that, um, even if it makes him have to run to the bathroom a lot more often because he knows it'll help his heart. Um, but he may not be willing to continue taking insulin injections for his diabetes because he has arthritis in his hands and he has a hard time injecting and feels like this worsens his quality of life more than it improves it. And, and so sometimes it's, there's, a, there's a negotiation process here, but ultimately Dave is the one that gets to decide which trade-offs are worth it for him. Um, so Dave might say, and this is an example of a meaningful healthcare goal that's really specific, but also flexible, is that he wants to manage his arthritis enough that he's able to walk his dog for at least 10 minutes a day. All right, so when you're working with your healthcare team, you're gonna need help to answer some of these questions. And so my advice for you would be to ask lots of questions. And when your doctor is discussing different various pathways for treating condition X, always come back to what you consider to be your, your most important health goal and ask your doctor how it's likely to impact that. And then feel empowered to voice your preferences. Tell your doctor where that line is for you and what you're able to do and what you think is helping. And then 
be equally comfortable telling them what isn't helping or what is really bothersome for you. Because a good healthcare provider will always make an effort to meet you where you are. And then I just encourage you to be specific. It's hard for a healthcare provider to determine the best path forward when um, we hear a vague complaint like, I don't like this medicine. So really spend some time thinking about what it is that you don't like about it. It makes me feel weak. It makes me feel dizzy. And that way we can really sort of tailor the solution around, um, you know, the best way to help you with that problem. And here are some examples of things that you might say to your healthcare provider. So now that you understand what's important to me, can we work on a solution that would allow me to walk from the parking lot to the bench half mile down the path to go fishing with my grandson? As an example, I really don't like X or what concerns me most is why, or my main priority is just making sure that I can do this. Um, even if it's uncomfortable, I'm willing to do whatever healthcare activity or take this medication if it helps me do more of this thing that's really important. So again, thinking about those trade-offs, maybe that trade-off is worth it to you, or I'm willing to check my blood sugar more often if it helps to meet my goals. But that kind of gets the um, healthcare provider to a point where they're able to break that cycle of just going through the checklist and saying, okay, you're someone with diabetes. We're going to make sure you're checking your blood sugar twice a day and you're getting 20 minutes of exercise um, seven days a week. And, you know, it takes them out of that checklist cycle and, and makes them stop and think, okay, how many of the things on this checklist are actually going to help Dave? Um, walk his dog for 10 minutes a day. Questions before I move into the last bit of this? Um, I think we're good to move on, Tasha. So I'm not okay. seeing anything that needs really to be clarified, but we will have some questions at the end. Sure. Okay. So I'm going to talk about a couple of different ladies who I'm gonna call Ms. Smith and Ms. Jones. Both of these women are 78 years old um, and they both have diabetes, um, but that's kind of where their resemblance ends. So Ms. Smith, um, she has cholesterol, she has macular degeneration and sees an eye doctor and she takes insulin and some oral medications to help her control her diabetes. Um, if you skip down to the bottom there on the left side, her hemoglobin A1C is 7.2%. If that's a number that means nothing to you, don't worry because I'm going to come back to this. Um, it's the same as Ms. Jones. They both have diabetes with an A1C of 7.2%. And they're both on insulin and three oral medications. And they both take Lipitor 20 milligrams daily for their cholesterol. And probably uh, Ms. Smith, you know, she might be on a preservation supplement to delay progression of her macular degeneration. Likely Ms. Jones is on a number of other things as well for the conditions that you see listed there. But here's the areas of overlap. They both take some similar medications. Um, but whereas Ms. Smith lives alone and really manages quite well and, and goes often to visit family and friends, um, either in a pre-COVID world or in a post-vaccine world, which I'm really hopeful that we're getting back to soon. Um, she's, she's engaged, she's social, she handles all of her own affairs. Ms. Jones had a stroke a few years ago that really kind of set her back and she had to move in with her son. She doesn't go out very much and her son helps her out a lot, um, bless him driving, cooking for, helping her manage her um, multiple medications. Ms. Smith is fairly active. She walks a couple miles a day. Ms. Jones um, uses a walker and she's had a couple of falls in the last six months. So um, a little bit more of an issue with her mobility potentially related to the stroke that she had. Ms. Smith feels like she's um, pretty with it, doesn't really have any concerns about her memory. Ms. Jones is starting to have some worry, um, which may or may not amount to anything, but she's having some mild concerns. And like I said, when we think about that, that one lab value that helps us at a glance determine how well controlled someone's diabetes is, we can see that they're both at that 
percent level. Okay, so I'm going to first come at this from the healthcare provider angle and tell you what's going to go through my mind, your primary care provider's mind, taking this information into account. And um, when that lab comes back and says A1C 7.2 percent. All right, so this information that you see on this slide comes from the American Diabetes Association. They publish their standards of care every year in January. So they just updated it last month based on all of the new information that's come in. They actually have a really nice chapter of their guidelines that's devoted to older adult care, um, but they aren't necessarily the gospel. Um, and definitely there are other organizations, other associations that have a little bit different guidance about what A1C we should be shooting for in an older person. That's beyond the scope of this talk. I'm just gonna focus on these guidelines from the ADA, which personally I tend to like to use because I feel like it's fairly easy and, and I like the criteria that they base their decisions around. So the American Diabetes Association says a reasonable A1C goal for someone who's healthy with few chronic illnesses, who's very independent with normal cognitive function could fall in that 7 to 7.5 range. So that's probably Ms. Smith. Um, whereas someone who's a little bit more complex because they might have multiple illnesses and need help with some of their activities of daily living. Um, and when I say activities of daily living, I'm talking about the things that Ms. Jones needs assistance from her son with, maybe um, driving and managing medications and preparing food and with some degree of mild or moderate cognitive impairment. And for that person, a reasonable A1C goal would be in the seven and a half to eight percent range. And then someone who's in even poorer health, perhaps in a long-term care facility or with more advanced cognitive decline or needing more help with things like getting dressed or bathing, then we would even consider that an A1C goal of eight to eight and a half percent would be reasonable because we're trying to weigh in the other risks of, of treating diabetes to a lower goal. Than that. So a doctor might conclude that Ms. Smith is right where she needs to be with an A1C of 7.2%. Um, so they wouldn't recommend any changes for her. But on the other hand, um, with Ms. Jones, an A1C goal of seven and a half to eight percent is reasonable. At seven point two percent, I would be starting to think about whether we could actually get away with de-intensifying her regimen a little bit because she's on a lot of stuff. She takes insulin. She takes three different medications. So could we cut some of those medications that are more likely to cause a low blood sugar? Um, and allow her A1C to float up a little bit. So you can see how the approach would look different for these couple of women. And in the, the situation with diabetes, taking that just as an example, there are competing risks here, and these bubbles are in different spots for Ms. Smith and Ms. Jones. On the one hand, we want to manage high blood sugars because we know that if we don't, it can lead to dehydration, it can lead falls, which we don't like because it can cause head injuries and broken bones. And certainly we can see progression of other things down the road um, a handful of years, like eye damage, nerve damage. But on the other hand, if we go overboard, then we have to think about low blood sugars, um, which can cause a lot of the same issues, certainly falls leading again to the same broken bones and head injuries a lot of emergency room visits. This is why glucose lowering medications were one of those on the list of, you know, the top three families of drugs that um, are associated with 60% of emergency department visits for adverse drug events. And then um, other symptoms associated with low blood sugar, like feeling shaky or feeling confused. Um, and not all of these symptoms um, are, are noticeable in people, especially with long-standing diabetes. So we have to manage both of those things. All right, so that's, that may be where I'm coming from as I think through just diabetes. And of course I'm doing Ms. Smith and Ms. Jones a disservice if I only think about them as someone with diabetes, right? There's a lot more to it. So I wanna get to know them. And when I ask 
these questions like we asked Dave earlier. Ms. Smith says um, of the relationships that are most important to her, that she's really close with her two sons and her five grandchildren and, and all of her close network of friends. Whereas Ms. Jones, um, she really just has her son and she has a close relationship with him. Ms. Smith says that things that really bring her a lot of joy are things like babysitting her grandkids and taking brisk walks around her neighborhood and baking. Whereas Ms. Jones um, likes to do word search and she likes to read and she likes to crochet baby blankets to donate to the hospital for newborns. Um, when we pose the question, when taking care of yourself, what's most important to you? Ms. Smith might say that she wants to stay physically fit um, and not have to depend very much on other people. Whereas Ms. Jones is just in a different place with all of that. She wants to continue to be able to walk and maintain her mobility. And she feels bad burdening her son. So she doesn't want to have to depend on him for very much, um, any much more than, than she already does. Ms. Smith says, um, in, in thinking through her health care, that she just wants to preserve her eyesight so that she can keep baking because she's noticed that it's a little bit harder to read her cookbook or see the lines that she uses to measure on the measuring cup um, and to manage her chronic conditions so that she can remain independent. Whereas Ms. Jones says that she would love to be able to stay with her son in the house that she bought with her husband 60 years ago. She gets to stay in that home. And finally, when we ask what healthcare activities are not worth the added burden or discomfort, or would you prefer to focus on minimizing, Ms. Smith might say having to check her blood sugar, which is important because she injects insulin, um, but doing so twice a day really interferes with her ability to get out because she has to take all of her supplies with her. And then that interferes with her ability to spend time with her grandchildren and makes her feel like she's sicker than she really thinks that she is. Whereas Miss Jones says she just has horrible pains in her legs that started, she started taking um, Lipitor and so she'd really like to not have to take that. All right, so now let's talk about the way that we're treating cholesterol for both of these ladies. And I'm just gonna show you what the guidelines tell us to do as healthcare providers. So Ms. Jones fits into this category of people older than 75. Um, although as I say that, yeah, they're 78, okay. Older than 75 um, with heart disease, which we know that Ms. Jones has heart disease. So for her, we may be trying to prevent the second event, um, right? She, she has, she's had a stroke. And taking a medication like a statin is going to be associated with the lower likelihood of her having a second stroke. So the guidelines say a moderate or high intensity statin like Lipitor, 20 milligrams is recommended. Ms. Smith doesn't have heart disease. So the guidelines say in people older than 75 who have diabetes, it may be reasonable to initiate a statin after we have a discussion about potential risk and benefits a little bit softer recommendation. Use one if you can get away with it. Um, it could be reasonable. But for Ms. Jones, here, here we have a trade-off, right? Because we know that there's a fairly strong recommendation for her to take a statin to prevent another stroke, but she said she doesn't want to take it anymore. It's causing her to have pains in her legs. So what her healthcare provider can and should say is that Certain healthcare activities may make some things better while making others worse. And it's really up to her ultimately to decide which trade off makes sense in her life. Now, this is a little bit of nuance that I don't have time to get into. If I was taking care of Ms. Jones, I would probably say, okay, if you're willing to still try a statin, we could switch to one, not Lipitor, that's less likely to cause these muscle aches because we do know that some statins are more associated with those muscle aches than others. Um, but, if, but, but some people have a hard time tolerating any statin whatsoever. And if Lipitor is the fourth or fifth statin that, that Ms. Jones has tried, then again, it's, it's difficult, but kind of striking that balance between, okay, I wanna prioritize preventing another stroke that would make me more reliant on others to provide basic care 
versus these really, um, really debilitating leg pains. All right, so going back to Ms. Smith then, what this decision might look like, and this is a tool that I am really a big fan of in my own practice. We might use something like this decision aid, which um, is produced by the Mayo Clinic. It's available for free online if you Google Mayo Clinic statin decision aid. And this helps us visualize the difference in her risk of a heart attack taking a statin versus not taking one. And then she can decide whether it's really worth it for her to take one. So let's say for Ms. Smith, when we put in her current blood pressure and all of her cholesterol numbers and the fact that she doesn't smoke, but she does have diabetes, it spits out this number and says, for people like Ms. Smith, if we had take 100 of them, 100 people just like her, in the next 10 years, 30, of those people will have a heart attack and 70 will not. And then what we can do with this decision aid is say, all right, what happens when we add a statin? And you can see that of those 30 people who would have had a heart attack, seven are now spared from a heart attack by taking a statin. And then Ms. Smith gets to be in control of the decision for whether it's worth it to her to take this other medication, which she may not be having any side effects from, or isn't likely to experience side effects from, if it takes her risk of having a heart attack down from 30 and 100 to 23 and 100. For some people, the answer to that is undeniably yes, and for others, it is undeniably no. Okay, so hopefully that kind of helps you think about like the way that the healthcare provider is considering this situation and trying to take into consideration what guidelines recommend and the way that your preferences and values and goals need to fit in with that. Because at the end of the day, we know that these recommendations, even if they're strong recommendations from the guidelines, are based on studies that do not do a good job of including people like Ms. Smith and Ms. Jones they're more likely to include people like Ms. Smith than Ms. Jones because people like Ms. Jones get excluded all the time from these studies because they've already had a stroke or they have diabetes. You know, people get excluded from these studies for all types of things. So then we have to determine, okay, does the conclusion of this study actually apply to someone who would have been excluded from being enrolled in the study in the first place? So in summary, be your own advocate. Feel empowered to ask questions about your care. And if you're in a relationship with a provider where you do not feel empowered to ask these questions, consider whether you need to create a relationship with another team member or find a different doctor. Think about what matters most to you and push for that. And sometimes there's some education involved with this, right? Like, not everybody immediately draws a connection between, okay, if I take this water pill, it's not worth it to me to have to go to the bathroom eight times during church. But if your number one goal is to be able to breathe well and keep fluid off your lungs if you have heart failure, then, then it might involve a little bit of manipulation of the plan because if we just stop the water pill so that you don't have to go to the bathroom, then the trade-off is the breathing. Request a prescription checkup. So asking your healthcare team to help you sort out which of your medications are really benefiting and servicing your goals and which are just standing in your way of meeting those goals. And finally, being mindful of medications that pose significant long-term risk and really consider weaning slowly off of those. So I'm going to go back and talk more about Gary. This is all of the same information that I presented to you at the beginning of this talk, beginning with in the red box here now, age 65, he's prescribed a medication for high blood pressure and a medication for cholesterol. But what if at age 72, instead of being prescribed a third medication for blood sugar, his doctor took the time to explain that there were different options available to Gary 
and allowed him to be involved in the choice of whether to start another medication or try some lifestyle changes first. And then what about if at age 73, instead of the doctor reacting to new guidelines, they put Gary's blood pressure in a higher risk category, the PCP or the primary care provider noted that patients like Gary, given all of his conditions and everything else he has going on and what's important to him, may not actually be best served by those new guidelines. So there's a conversation about risks versus benefits and Gary gets to be a part of the choice about whether or not to intensify the treatment that he receives for high blood pressure. So now maybe he's made the decision not to add another blood pressure medication, which we know can increase the risk for dizziness, lightheadedness, and falls. So that fall doesn't happen. Now, if it does happen, what might have happened differently was that the emergency department prescriber might recognize that there are significant risks with opioid medications, so he prescribes something else instead. Now, ibuprofen is an NSAID. I've brought that up a couple of times as a medicine that isn't my favorite if we can get by with um, something like Tylenol instead, but especially for short-term use, it's probably a safer choice than an opioid. So Gary gets sent home on ibuprofen instead of an opioid. And importantly, this time, his primary care provider is actually informed about that change. Now, if we fast forward a little bit from there, in the original scenario, Gary was having trouble sleeping, he was feeling depressed, and so he got some medications for both of those problems. But what if instead his doctor talked with him some more and learned that his depression was actually situational, his brother died, and she instead refers him to a grief counselor to help him talk through some of that so that he doesn't have to start another medication and provide some information about sleep hygiene, which are just basic tips to help people rest better at night. Now he's avoided not one, but two medications that impact brain function and that can interact with one another to heighten the risk for a problem like we saw in the very last panel here where Gary rear-ended a car at a traffic light because he was dizzy and confused from taking multiple medications that impact brain function. And what if instead the scenario was that suspecting medication overload, Gary's primary care provider offered a prescription checkup and actually stopped or deprescribed medications that were considered unnecessary. His entire trajectory would have looked very different. So it's never too late to start asking some of those questions. Um, I am happy to take your questions. Looks like we have about 15 minutes, which hopefully will be sufficient. Um, and I just want to reiterate something that I said earlier that Hopefully, if nothing else, you've taken away that this is just such an individual choice. And please don't um, mistake anything I've said for any sort of blanket statement that we shouldn't be treating high blood pressure in people who are older or we shouldn't be treating diabetes. None of that is the case. It's just a matter of balancing risks and benefits for each individual person. All right, so what questions do we have? Sure. So Tasha, I want to start with um, just a little bit more of a broad question to you. Um, I mean, I think many of us grew up in the age of pharmacists, RPHs, and now uh, the field of pharmacy has really transitioned almost fully to PharmDs. Um, can you just talk to that for a minute? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, even when I started pharmacy school, I, I didn't have the, the clearest perception. I think we all still were envisioning the pharmacists um, filling prescription bottles behind the counter at the drugstore. And certainly that is still a place that a lot of pharmacists hang out and so they are such important piece of the healthcare team. Um, but some of us, I do not work in a pharmacy at all. So, um, if you kind of go the more clinical track, now there's residency training available for pharmacists, similar to what physicians go through and some other healthcare providers. 
And if you look at my name and the, the letters after my name on this slide, one of them is CPP. Now that's specific to North Carolina and it stands for Clinical Pharmacist Practitioner. It's almost like being a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant. Now I don't diagnose things, that is not my training. What I am is a medication expert. So what that allows me to do under a certain scope with the physicians that I work with at Mayhack is they take care of the diagnosis and then I'm involved in helping to choose the most appropriate treatment so I can actually prescribe and de-prescribe medications for those patients. And so Tasha, that sort of leads me to another question or just clarification for people is that what PharmDs can do in one state can be different from what they can do in another state. Very much the case. And North Carolina is one of the most progressive states in the country in terms of what pharmacists can do. But they always have to work under a supervising physician. So more right. than likely, you're not going to walk in to fill your prescription at CVS and encounter a pharmacist who's able to just start a new medication for you. It depends on setting. Great. Okay. So um, there was a question about supplements and um, my question sort of more general is how should people inform their prescribing provider about their use of supplements and why is it important for their HCP to know about all prescribed meds as well as over-the-counter meds? Yeah, I love that question. Products. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. It is so important. I think I do uh, um, occasionally catch folks off guard among the, the people that I care for when I ask for a list of their medications and they just tell me about the two prescriptions that they take. But I know that there are 10 or 11 other things that they're actually putting in their bodies. And so um, it is so important that we have a complete picture of all of those things because one, they can interact ways that you might not expect other supplements or with prescription medications. And two, um, just keep in mind that just because something is available over the counter doesn't mean that it's completely harmless, mm -hmm. which is why I, I encourage people to really be cognizant of what they're, what they're putting in their bodies. So when I ask for people to tell me about their supplements, it isn't so I can just make a blanket statement that they should stop taking all of them right. so that we can, um, make decisions about but whether all of those are, are truly beneficial or not. And generally speaking, prescribed meds go through much more research and supplements can really come on the market with, with almost no uh, clinical yeah. studies. Yeah, it's certainly a more rigorous process. If I say a prescription medication is effective I know that that has been tested in thousands of people. For a supplement to make a claim that it's effective, it only requires one person on the sidewalk to give a testimonial that it was helpful for them. Right. Okay, so we have a question. Where should folks go to get individual advice regarding polypharmacy? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, and it's something that I feel like we could be doing a better job in our community of making those resources available. But I think the easiest answer is to start with your pharmacist where you fill your prescription medications. Um, and and it, let's say you get all of your medications filled at a mail order pharmacy. You can call and talk to a pharmacist there. I mean, they certainly have to have one on staff, but a lot of times it's just easier to talk to someone face-to-face. -face. But you can go into a pharmacy even if you don't fill prescriptions there and certainly ask questions. Um, and I promise I'm not being paid to say this, but I will say that like Sona Pharmacy, some of these, um, I just really respect the folks who work there and think that they go out of their way to, to make sure that people are well cared for. So some of the pharmacies um, in my mind are, are a little bit more set up to be able to handle that than others. So um, just sort of taking this one step further, um, you know, so say someone is seeing their primary care provider um, in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, I would say that most practices do not have a PharmD, say, on staff. Um, so, I mean, if someone says, I'd like to go through a prescription med and supplement review or checkup, as you said, mm -hmm. would they get a funny look or... 
Well, I would hope not. <laughs> yeah, I would hope not. Um, the the provider should be well equipped to do that. And and there are a growing number of practices who do have an in house pharmacist. Um, Mayhek has twelve of us. Um, Asheville Family Medicine has a pharmacist. There are actually a number of them around town now where, where we're seeing more of this, but um, a lot of the smaller private practices, you're right, do not. But, Good. Yeah. Okay, um, next question. You referred in passing to the prescription of statins after a heart attack, um, mm -hmm. but we know that's hardly the only reason why. Um, but what are the pros and cons of statins generally, are there significant drug interactions with statins? I mean, that, that's really a few questions in one, but talk a little bit about statins. About statins. I have an entire one hour talk that I've given for Ollie previously about statins. So um, I probably don't have time to do that question justice. Um, but I, mean, I guess if I had to simplify and give an abbreviated answer, I would say that um, we have a lot of high quality evidence that suggests if you've had a heart attack before that statins do a pretty good job of preventing another one. We don't have that degree of high quality evidence to support using them, um, particularly for older people if you have never had a heart attack or stroke. Um, which is the reason that I use that decision aid that I showed an example of with a lot of the people that I take care of so that we can make a decision because I don't think it's appropriate to say that we just flat shouldn't be using statins to prevent the first heart attack or stroke in, in people. You know, someone who's vital and fit like Ms. Smith and the example who um, can tolerate taking one just fine. In, in some cases, we might decide why not add this medication that will decrease her risk of having a major event that much more, um, which is not to say that I would push her into that, but I think it's completely reasonable. Um, I just, I would, I would err a little bit more on the side of, oh, it would really be great if we could help you tolerate a statin in the case of Ms. Jones, who has had an event, because we know they do a really fine job of preventing and, another one. Am I correct in sort of summarizing statins, I mean, the, in the vast majority of people who take statins do pretty fine with them? The majority do, the yep. majority do. Um, but there is a not insignificant minority who does experience um, it might be that, a, that another statin could be tried that works. Another better. one could be tried. So another statin question, are they associated with memory loss? Yeah, that's a great question. There is an association. Again, this is not, it's not common enough for us to be able to um, clearly explain what that link is and whether it's truly cause and effect. Um, now, the good news is for people who have described some form of memory loss with a statin, it appears to be reversible when it's discontinued. So it's not like it's causing Alzheimer's disease, you know, this irreversible process that's just gonna continue. Um, but some people have, have described some sort of fogginess or, or something to that extent. Now, there are other, when I, when I hear about that, I usually suggest that we try a different statin in situation as people who are having leg pains because the, the statins that cause leg pains are also the ones that are maybe a little more associated with, <laughs> excuse me, with memory loss. Great. The next question I think brings up a really important point is um, say someone is hospitalized and they're prescribed a bunch of medications when they're in the hospital. Yeah. Um, that transition time from what you do in hospital, what you're discharged with mm -hmm. to, um, you know, going back to your doc yep. um, or prescriber, um, you know, and how that, how that really should ideally be done. Yeah. Oh gosh. I wish I knew the, the perfect <laughs> answer to that. This is so problematic. Um, transitions of care is such a buzzword in the, in the healthcare system right now, because I don't know if anybody's really hit the nail on the head and how to do this well. 
um, anytime information is changing hands. I think it's one thing when you're in sort of a closed system like the VA um, where everybody has access to the same information, but when you're going from a private hospital to a private doctor's office, and I mean, you really have to be your own advocate and carry that medication list with you. So, um, you know, different practices have different ways of doing it. And I like to think, you know, where I work at Mayhack, that, that there is a process that um, keeps fewer things from falling through the cracks, but but certainly nothing perfect. So my main advice would just be to um, make sure that you ask lots of questions on that transition and, and carry a list and be constantly updating it um, because there is a lot that gets lost in translation with those transitions. Okay, a couple of people who are on the uh, health education committee have noted that the talk that you gave at Ollie about statins may be available in the archives. Oh, good. Um, so, um, you know, maybe that's something that in listing your this talk mm -hmm. um, that could be linked to it. I don't know if that's yeah. a possible or not. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm going to bring this to a close with what I think is su supporting and reinforcing the message that you gave, but sort of a uh, something that may bring a bring a smile to people's face and it says I appreciate your encouragement to ask questions of their providers my mother who's 97 is from a generation that would never question the doctor even though she thought it was a bad idea yes <laughs> yes I so uh, question, I understand question, that yep yep and I, I think we you know you've I think you use the term, but um, I think we've hopefully more so moved into an era of um, medicine that talks about shared decision making. Yeah. And you use that a lot and also person centered care. Yeah. Um, so those are also more likely buzzwords than yes. uh, actually fully operationalized. But sure. um, yeah. yeah. So, um, thank you, thank you, thank you. I know you need to run off and give some more vaccines. So we really appreciate your service in that area. Um, and um, thanks so much for taking your time and giving what I think was a really excellent presentation on a really important topic. It's been fun. I appreciate you helping moderate Hope. Um, my email address and phone number are listed here. So for people who have more, more individual questions, I, I would love to hear from you. Good. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.